much for that. Well, Benson, that's wonderful. And once again, I'm the president of the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, Kelee Akina. The Institute is Hawaii's leading independent research think tank that comes up with solutions for the government in terms of individual liberty, free markets, and limited accountable government. And, and I'm also a trustee at large in the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, and I'll share with you a little bit about both. But as I mentioned earlier, what I would really like to have happen is for you to ask your questions and give us the opportunity to interact. Always love coming to South Hilo Rotary. Well, at the Institute, we have some recent breaking research that nobody else is doing. And the, behind me is Honolulu Harbor, where you'll see Matson and Pasha ships coming in and going, not as me many as you might think, but at least they are keeping a lifeline alive in terms of shipping to and from the mainland and across the world. Well, John Fitzgerald, our dear friend, asked me to talk with you a bit about our research into the Grassroot Institute. And this year was a breakthrough year. We completed a two year study, which now has the first quantification of how much the Jones Act costs Hawaii. Now, for those of you not familiar with it, the Jones Act is a law from the 1920s. It's been here 100 years that basically says that in the, transporting cargo between two U.S. ports, four things have to happen. It has to be done on a ship that is built in the United States. And that's number one. Number two, crewed by a U.S. crew for the most part, owned by a U.S. company and flagged in the U.S. Now, those requirements have cost us a lot of money. Uh, for example, we now produce fewer ships than virtually any other shipbuilding nation in, in the world, and they are now the most expensive. Our ships cost five times the amount it costs to get a ship from one of our allies. And that creates monopolies, that creates inefficiencies. And we could go in depth, but I just wanna refer you to a study we have quantifying the cost of the Jones Act of Hawaii you can get that study on our website, grassrootinstitute.org. A couple of highlights. Uh, one is that we know now that the Jones Act costs us at least $1.3 billion annually here in the state of Hawaii. And that can be reduced to a cost to every single family that pays a surcharge because of this law. In addition to that, we've studied almost 200 industry sectors and found out that they are impacted by the Jones Act as well. So I just refer you to that chart uh, in the study. But uh, one of the things that we were very glad for is that this research has been able to move the issue to bipartisan status. In other words, it's not a Republican issue. It's not a Democrat issue. It's an issue where there are individuals on both sides of the aisle advocating for change. One of the things we did this year was bring together two partisans. One was Representative Ed Case, our representative in Congress, and Senator Mike Lee of Utah. And they were basically on hand for the release of this information and helped us to be able to explain that we've found a middle ground that will work for the unions, that will work for the Democratic Party, that will work for the Republicans. And that's our spirit. That middle ground is, let's stop trying to repeal this 100-year-old law, but let's find the part of it that we can fix and so that we can actually improve the economy and yet leave it on the table for those who value it. And that would be the build requirement, the requirement that says we can only use ships that are built in the United States. If we can modify that, we can have an update that really brings down the cost of living for the people of Hawaii. So we're making headway in terms of being able to find that middle ground and be able to get some change. And that's with the Jones Act. And so I've come up with a, a phrase, instead of saying it's time to repeal the Jones Act, I say it's time to update the Jones Act for the 21st century. And that will bring around the, the, the cause of reforming the Jones Act, people on both sides of the issue. Now that's one major area where the Grassroot Institute is a leading researcher in the country. Uh, there's another area where we have had some breaking news and research that I think will be a very significant interest to those of you concerned about the economy. One of the biggest factors in our failing economy in Hawaii is the cost of government. Government is exorbitant. And one of the reasons government costs so much is because of the inefficiencies of operating our government. Very often the government is trying to run businesses like the Honolulu airport uh, for which it does not have the competence. 
for which private businesses would do a much better job. And another uh, one would be the Honolulu Rail Project. But um, another reason government costs us so much is the hidden costs of debt. There's a huge debt problem with the government. We call this unfunded liabilities. In other words, money that the government owes that it doesn't have. And Grassroot Institute was significant in publicizing the fact that we had a, two years ago in 2018, about 2.6, excuse me, $26 billion of unfunded liabilities. About $13 billion is what we owed our public sector uh, workers in pensions, and we didn't have that, 13 billion, and about 12.6 billion in terms of their health care. That was about 26 billion. But the big news, bigger than that, in 2019, we let you know that that figure had risen if you add in infrastructure costs and so forth to $88 billion. Now think about that. That means in a period of 30 years, our government owes $88 billion that it doesn't have. It owes it to its public sector workers. It owes it to uh, infrastructure costs, emergency needs and so forth. And who's gonna pay that money? It's gonna be the taxpayers, not just our generation, but our children, our grandchildren, and our great, great grandchildren just to break even. Well, the coronavirus hit and government was so ill-founded in terms of its debt levels that this debt has skyrocketed and Grassroot Institute has recently released the latest figures. As of now, that debt has risen by $9 billion. We now owe $97 billion that we don't have over the next 30 years and even if we manage to get through the short-term crisis of the coronavirus in terms of government costs, we're going to have that long-term debt problem. It's a huge problem for our state. Going into the coronavirus um, crisis, we were already weak. And coming out of it, we will be even weaker. Those are two major findings of the Grassroot Institute. Here's a third one. There is a way out of this. Before the coronavirus crisis, the biggest economic issue in Hawaii was the cost of living. And the biggest factor in the cost of living is the cost of housing. It's exorbitant. And the reason we have a high cost of housing as analyzed at the Grassroot Institute is because we have an artificial scarcity of land. When I say artificial, I'm saying that it's a, a scarcity that we impose upon ourselves. Uh, take a guess at this. How much of the land mass of the state of Hawaii do we build on? What percentage? And by the way, Big Islanders usually get a better answer to this than anyone else. What do you think it is? What percentage of the land mass in the state of Hawaii do we actually have urban development on and building? Any guesses? You'll have to unmute yourself. I, I see 10%. 10%, 10 yeah. I, I think it's it's 10% or lower. You guys have good instincts, probably because you drive for mile after mile after mile <laughs> on lava fields. <laughs> you, the answer is 5%. 95% mm. of all land mass in the state of Hawaii is undeveloped. Half of that is for watershed preserve, aquifer. The other half is agriculture. And by the way, the vast majority of agriculture land itself is not being used for anything whatsoever. So 95% of the land is available. We don't have a scarcity of the land. If we could develop on a little bit more land, we could solve our housing problem. It's a basic economic problem in terms of supply and demand. Take, for example, the 5% that we develop on right now. If we were to develop on one percentage point more, go from five points to six points, how much more land would we open for development? Five to six is one sixth more, it's 20% more. If we went from 5% to 7%, we would develop on 40% more land. If we went from 5% to 8%, that would be 60% more land. Now, can you imagine increasing the supply of land tremendously? The first lesson in your college economics class 101 
was supply and demand. When supply goes up and demand remains at least constant, what happens to the price point? The price goes down. So as long as we don't allow billionaires from China to come in and buy all that property, we could allow our local residents to be able to experience a drop in prices. Now, there's reason that we don't do that. And Grassroot Institute has exposed that. Our recent report called Reform the Hawaii LUC Land Use Commission shows that there is a confusing set of land use and zoning laws that ultimately end up restricting development to that 5%. It's not a big law or rule that says restrict it to 5%. It just happens, in fact, that we create, because of the confusing nature of land use and um, zoning in, in the state of Hawaii and the counties, we end up suppressing the development of land. And if we could just solve that one problem, we could increase the supply of land, solve the artificial scarcity of land, and with that, we would be able to bring down the cost of Hawaii's biggest cost of living driver. That was something that needed to happen before the coronavirus pandemic. And it's something that has to happen after the pandemic. I've referred to you, you to three reports that we have online, quantifying the cost of the Jones Act to Hawaii, states unfunded liabilities, and reforming the Hawaii Land Use Commission. Let me close this segment by referring you to one final report that we have done. And you can get all of this at grassrootinstitute.org. That's grassroot without an S at the end. The fourth report I would refer you to is Roadmap to Prosperity, How Hawaii Can Recover and Even Excel After the Coronavirus Lockdown. We've put together 23 prescriptions that we've sent to the governor and to the legislature on what needs to be done in order to get us out of the coronavirus economic crisis. Let me just say this without going in, into depth. I could spend three hours with you telling you why this is so. We are headed for a massive economic fallout. In fact, the University of Hawaii Economic Research Organization has told us that we're gonna have the highest level of people leaving Hawaii in the next two years that we have ever experienced particularly people leaving the neighbor islands because of the lack of job opportunities and the high cost of living. Uh, we are just at the beginning of that. The government has not taken the kinds of steps necessary in order to allay this. And in fact, the government is continuing to do the kinds of things that put us into a debt position before we encounter the coronavirus crisis. Basically, we have to stop spending in the government and bring that down by at least 20%. We have to transition most of the government businesses that it tries to run to the private sector and begin making a profit in sectors where we're currently running bankrupt businesses like the state hospital system or the airports and so forth. We have to reduce regulations so that businesses can thrive. We have to reduce taxes on businesses and individuals. Uh, we have to stop the massive borrowing that many of our legislators currently think is the salvation for our, our state government. And there are 23 prescriptions that we've put together and I think you'll find them interesting. Uh, they're, they're worth holding your government officials accountable to. And so that's just a summary of what we've been doing in the last six months at the Grassroot Institute. I invite you to subscribe to our free newsletter. You can do that when you go online. And again, it's grassrootinstitute.org. We produce reports that are sent out weekly. I write a column every week, and I'd love to give that to you. Uh, before opening up to questions, I had the opportunity to, to work at two different levels when it comes to fixing our economy and making life livable for people. At the Grassroots Institute, I'm able to be at a high, like 30,000 foot level, looking down at the entire system on what best practices are and uh, what the solutions are. But as a trustee in the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, I'm an elected official and I'm in the trenches. I'm able to be in a government agency in which we're able to actually look at how government is run at the economies and the inefficiencies and how it fulfills its mission. And so that's down in the trenches. And one of the things that I did in 2016 when I was elected to office in my first term, which is a four-year term, 
I decided to do everything I could with all my might to restore the credibility of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. It had hit a, an all time low. Uh, the state auditor in 2018 said the grant system was malfunctioning and it wasn't what you knew, but who you knew, kind of like the friends and family program to get money for, from OHA. Uh, their own, uh, OHA's own uh, accountants were telling them that they were spending at a rate that they would completely spend down the trust fund within 10 years. They were spending so much without putting back into the trust fund. And then there, were, there was a state audit that was scathing in terms of its rebuke of OHA. I set about to try to fix this. And although I faced much opposition, I was able to get an independent audit that was able to show the red flags that have to be dealt with and ultimately set forth a blueprint for fixing OHA. Uh, that's something that has been compelling to me, and I'm committed to doing everything I can to see that that organization results in more housing, jobs, education, and health care for the Hawaiian people. Well, with all that said, I think I've talked enough, and I would love to hear what your thoughts are or any questions that you have for me on anything that I'm doing. And uh, I have honored what John Fitzgerald told me to do. He said, do your best to talk about both grassroots and the, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs and do it in 20 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So I'd love to hear what you have to say or offer. Any questions? Okay, Lee, this is Keith Merrick. I do have a question. So can you just kind of expand a little bit and, you know, I guess maybe it's a naive question, but what exactly does the Office of Hawaiian Affairs do? What are you guys in charge of? Because I mean, I know it's the lands for where Hawaiians can live, but beyond that, I, I really don't know. Fantastic question. What is the Office of Hawaiian Affairs supposed to do? Be through our state constitution, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs was established to better the conditions of Native Hawaiians. Right. And the resources that come for that come from the Public Lands Trust. Right. Th these ultimately are lands that belong to the Kingdom of Hawaii. And so our government said, Th that the Hawaii government said that revenues from these lands, part of the revenues, 20%, will go to bettering the conditions of Native Hawaiians. And that's what the job of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs is. Um, I interpret bettering the conditions of Native Hawaiians as being making sure that Hawaiians get housing and jobs and education and health care. Uh, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs has not always pursued that mission. One of the trustees before I became a trustee had quantified that it had spent $50 million in trying to start a race-based nation. And you have to understand this is a government agency trying to pursue that. And uh, I'm very pleased that I've been able to stop the Office of Hawaiian Affairs from going forward and using its money for that. I have no problem if, if Hawaiians outside of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs want to organize under the First Amendment and pursue a race-based nation. But to have your state government uh, do that, it has two problems. One, that's public funds that are being used. And two, it takes away from a, a massive need, regardless of what Hawaiians may feel and their split on the issue of sovereignty, all Hawaiians can come together and all residents of the state can say the Office of Hawaiian Affairs should be focused on housing and jobs and education and healthcare. And so that's the fundamental role it should play. I just want to correct one thing. You mentioned that th they're involved in getting Hawaiians onto Hawaiian uh, homelands. That's actually a different agency other than the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. And although it's a different agency, the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, I personally believe that the Office of Hawaiian Affairs should do more in its capacity to get Hawaiians off the waiting list of 27,000 people and onto the land. So the purpose of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs is to better the conditions of Native Hawaiians. It's an economic purpose, an educational purpose, um, and it should stay away from political issues. Hope that answered. Cool. Thank you. Um, Kelly, I, I had a question about, um, about uh, privatizing some of the state's agencies um, and I, I believe that you're, you're correct is that, uh, you know, the government um, has already proved that it's, um, it's not a good, um, 
you know, maintainer and operate operator of certain businesses. So um, one of the things, of course, that every time somebody talks about uh, public private partnerships, there's always that pushback from the unions who oppose privatization. So every time some kind of measure comes up before the legislature, the people that show up at these hearings are pro-union people. So how do you how do you think that uh, that we could get around that and uh, and be able to have like a port authority or somebody else, uh, some other private entities coming in and running uh, uh, state state entities for now? Well, I think it's important to point out that it's not a zero sum game. It's not if you get more jobs in the private sector, you will reduce jobs in the union sector. That's yeah. simply not true. Right. In fact, if you have more and better competition from the private sector, mm -hmm. you actually increase the marketplace and you'll end up with more jobs in the union as well. You'll have a more efficient system altogether. That's the, that's the thing we have to look at. Um, I, I think we have to understand that there's an education issue here. Uh, a couple of years ago, in fact, about five years ago, Grassroot Institute did a study that showed that the state public hospital system is actually bankrupt. Mm. And the only way that it survives is at the end of every year, the legislature pours money into it to hide the fact that it's bankrupt. Well, one hospital system, the Maui hospital system run by the state was doing so badly, and I kid you not, that some of our Grassroot Institute supporters came to me and said they were actually giving money to the hospital and doing charitable events in order to keep clinics open. Clinics were closing down in the Maui hospital system and employees who were state government union worker employees were losing their jobs. Now I mentioned this because they got very upset at this. They saw the system run by the state government that was unionized that couldn't even guarantee them their jobs. And as a result, we went to work with a bunch of them and the legislature ultimately passed a law and governor, governor signed it that allowed the hospitals on Maui to be privatized. And they went out to bid for management and Kaiser won the bid. And Kaiser put into place three years ago, a plan that is now working financially and very soon they're going to break even. Now, here's the, the, the good news that, that happened. Union members obviously were out of a job when Kaiser took it over. But 98 to 99 percent of all of those union workers were hired back by Kaiser at the same or higher salaries with comparable benefits. And the hospital now is financially viable and they're keeping their jobs rather than going out of work. Now that's a great success story. And the people who won were the poor people who needed the hospital, the residents of Maui, the hospital itself, and the union workers who were able to transition to a more secure status than they had before. And I think that when we look at the bottom line, those are the goods that we want. But the fact is, if you don't characterize this in terms of the goods it produces, you can find a lot of resistance from the union. When we went to battle in order to help save the hospital, we found that a huge number of union members actually were advocating for, for the changes that we were promoting in terms of privatizing the hospital. And you can see that over and over in different businesses. I'm sure you'd see that same thing happen if we could privatize the management of the airports. So that's one pathway in answer to your question to bring people together. Um, same thing with the um, Jones Act. If you actually were able to um, bring about some of the reforms that we are offering in terms of the Jones Act, you would actually increase the number of ships in Honolulu Harbor and Hilo Harbor and elsewhere. And with the increased commerce, you would have more stevedores, more longshoremen, you'd have more union jobs created. It wouldn't be a threat to the union. So I wanna close by saying what I said earlier, these kinds of reforms when they're done correctly with the market, actually are not a zero sum gain. It's not that the unions lose out and the private sector gains, it's that everybody gains. Hope that answered your question. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. Um, I've got another question, but uh, somebody else 
ask a question. If any anybody else have a question you want to ask, uh, go I, ahead. I, I have a question. Hi, Rosemary. Uh, hi. You mentioned that um, that a lot of the land that's zoned for agriculture isn't actually used for agriculture. And yet it seems like we notice, you know, even more in the pandemic than before that we need to diversify our economy more and not be so totally dependent on tourism and um, being more sufficient. I'm on a conference right yeah, now. I know. Um, are you on the phone system at all? No. Okay, it's gonna be turned off. Okay, you. okay, thank you. I'm, I'm in my clinic, sorry. Um, but uh, we, you know, it would be nice to be more self-sufficient in food and that land would be used and we could diversify our economy more. But what do we need to do to help that come about? That's a great question, Rosemary. You've got, you've put together a couple of issues that, that, that um, need to be addressed separately to some extent. Agriculture and diversification. Uh, the fundamental reason that agriculture is low in Hawaii is that government has been involved at too high a level. And as a result, we have been in the way of agricultural entrepreneurs that could really flourish if we could change our regulation structure here in the state. And I'm not talking only about state regulations, I'm talking about federal regulations that they have to work under as well. So there's no question about it. We need to grow our agricultural industry here in Hawaii and we can grow it. And the key to growing it is going to be technology infused agriculture, everything from aquaculture to uh, new forms of, of agriculture that are developing across the world. I mean, there have been breakthroughs in third world nations that, that put us in the, the dust, leave us in the dust because we're not even using them here in Hawaii. So on one hand, we need to have a much more aggressive growth of our agricultural sector. Now I move to the other issue, diversification. Uh, tourism is always going to be a major industry in Hawaii. That, that's not something we should resist. That, that's something we should build to the best level we can build. But at the same time, we need to become less dependent upon traditional tourism. And we need to have a whole range of other industries in Hawaii. Since the 60s, the state government has said that it was trying to promote diversification. But here's the fundamental problem. The way the government has gone about promoting diversification is choosing particular industries to back without enough market information. So whether it's solar, whether it's forms of agriculture, uh, there have been all kinds of industries, it's film and so forth. The governor, government has tried to back through subsidies, tax breaks, and so forth. And none, absolutely none of these businesses, including high tech and all the high tech parts that the government subsidized, none of them has produced a diversified industry base in Hawaii. And the fundamental flaw is that you cannot bring about thriving business through central government control. You have to get the government out of the way. You've got to reduce the tax structure on businesses. You've got to reduce the levels of regulation that uh, businesses have to, to go through. You, you've got to uh, get regulatory bodies that have actually worked against businesses out of the way. And you've got to create a climate in which you can actually bring capital into the state. Let me give you one example uh, that what really devastated much of the economy for the neighbor islands. That was the super ferry. Remember the super ferry back several years ago? Ultimately, part of the backstory of the super ferry and its demise and the, the tragedy that we don't have that opportunity for neighbor islands interconnectedness. Part of the backstory is that a group of businessmen in New York lost $70 million because they invested. And that story went around the entire world and for many years told people, you can't invest money in Hawaii because the government can't protect your project. The same thing is true about the 30 meter telescope on Mauna Kea. You have investors across the world that will back out of Hawaii and won't ever come here if that project is lost. Now, I'm not trying to advocate one way or the other. I'm just talking about the economic reality of what will happen to the climate in Hawaii 
in terms of capital investment. One of the problems with Hawaii is that it's not an attractive place for businesses to invest. So I've said a lot about this uh, and we, we've written it, uh, written things about this in our Roadmap to Prosperity, which I refer you to on our website. The government needs to create a climate which is attractive to businesses and get out of the way and allow them to grow. And I think that will create a natural diversity. Business by itself is in innovative in terms of diversification. Thanks, Rosemary. Yeah, I got one more uh, question, uh, uh, Kaylee. I know that uh, you know both Glenn and uh, uh, Keith have um, have children that are either uh, being educated on the mainland or are currently working on the mainland. And you uh, you talked earlier about uh, you know our economic downturn and and it's going to um, result in uh, you know basically this this brain drain of all of our uh, especially neighbor island people. Uh, moving to the mainland. So uh, what's your thoughts about that and why so much the outer islands and 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 uh, what can we do to, to help reverse that or or affect it in some positive way? Well, I think we've kind of discussed uh, and touched upon the reasons for the brain drain here in Hawaii. Yeah. Number one is the cost of living. Number two is <clears throat> the cost of housing in particular, especially for student, young people who go away and get their college and graduate degrees. Uh, it takes them years, perhaps over a decade to even come, even to think about getting into a mortgage situation. <laughs> and third, very importantly, perhaps just as important as the housing issue is the availability of jobs in industries that will be high paying to them for the investment they've made in their education. You, you take any other place in the country, you, you could drive to thriving economic centers. Um, we have four children, all of them grown, all of them Kamehameha school grads, uh, top-notch colleges on the mainland. All my four children live on the mainland now. They, they do that because there's not a single one of them that can match the salary that they're getting, the opportunities they're getting that they, they have in mainland markets. And that goes back to the issue of diversifying our economy. We are looking at 50 to 60 years of high level central control government in which you have tax structures and regulation, regulatory structures that work against entrepreneurial businesses. We can take each industry and tell stories from it, from agriculture to high tech that show that government interference has simply made this not a place that's healthy for businesses. We've got to solve that problem if we want to see our children come back. That's important. So what's, the, what, the yeah, what kind of, yeah, what kind of, uh, what kind of industries do you think have potential here that we might be able to attract those kind of high paying jobs um, you know, I know we have we have agriculture. We've talked about some of those things, but but um, are there any other kinds of industries you think that could be developed here that could uh, attract our young people back, or even your even your children? I mean, uh, what kinds of things are they involved in, or could they get a comparable job over here if an industry existed? Well, Hawaii has the potential for a broad range of industries, from traditional industries like tour like uh, tourism and mm -hmm. agriculture through high tech and th research. And the key thing is to be able to make Hawaii attractive enough for those industries to invest mm -hmm. here. So uh, it goes back to what I was saying before that when, when people are looking into third world nations, for example, there's a set of criteria that they look at to before they go in and invest. Uh, one of them happens to be the level of government interference. Uh, another one happens to be tax structure. Another is protection of contracts. And I mentioned that because that's an issue that has come up with the super ferry and with the, uh, with the 30 meter telescope as well. Hawaii is not a third world nation, but these are issues that 
companies look at when they go into third world nations that create levels of risk. So ironically, although we are in the first world, we, uh, in terms of entrepreneurial money and capital investment in Hawaii, are looked at like a third world nation. Uh, and that level of risk present, pre presents a problem in terms of being able to attract capital. As a result, Hawaii and its beautiful climate, its wonderful people, the, in, the hospitality it has for entrepreneurs has a high level of entrepreneurship that creates businesses at the first level. There are many uh, wonderful, um, innovative, high-tech businesses that get started here in Hawaii, but you almost never see them rise to the second and third levels of capitalization and in being able to uh, launch an initial public offering on the stock market. That's because the conditions needed for capital simply don't exist in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And until we solve that problem uh, by reducing government interference, we're not going to have a, a state that is going to be able to thrive and diversify. I don't want to sound pessimistic to everybody. I think there is a solution to this. So I encourage you to take, get a copy of our Roadmap to Prosperity at grassrootinstitute.org. But judging from your faces, I, I don't think I've made you smile. <laughs> <laughs> I think that there, there's great hope when we... Yeah take a look at the answers that we need and, and elect officials that understand this and hold them to it. Mm. Yeah, like Benson was right, uh, my oldest son, uh, he is an electrical engineer. At, uh, he graduated UH Manoa, but now he is uh, at Northrop Grumman Aerospace Company. Oh yeah. In, uh, in, uh, Cal in Torrance, California. But there is nothing uh, like that, a position out here uh, for him to do something like that, or even to come back to. And then my just graduated uh, law school at Seattle University, and then she'll be working uh, at a law firm that uh, will start her at a very significant amount, more than what the mayors make in Hawaii. And that's just the starting <laughs> level. <day. laughs> yeah. My daughter just finished college three years ago at Harvard. And uh, she just told me on Friday, she got a new job offer in a Silicon Valley company where she makes more than our governor. Well, she makes more than I do. And yes. so yes. I think it's a great opportunity for bright people, but we've got to really have a vision that we can cre create that environment here in Hawaii. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm interested in the prospects for like, like uh, uh, Kat that's on our call here, Catherine Reedberg, you see her in the middle of her screen, but you know, she has a young son now, you know, who's like still in elementary school. And I know that, you know, I've got grandkids that are in exactly the same age bracket. And I'm, you know, I'm wondering, um, you know, what, uh, how we need to counsel them going, going forward, you know? Oh, tell them that they've got to learn how to code. They've got to learn how to oh, yeah, okay. use the computer like the back of their hands. Yeah. I mean, the one thing that the coronavirus has shown us, which you're experiencing right now in this meeting, is that distance is one of the factors that has dropped out of mm -hmm. the economic equation, uh, thanks to technology. And that's going to grow tremendously. Uh, it's, they, you, you have to make sure that your children are technologically savvy. And the key thing is that you've got to switch a mindset that they have. That's you. Yeah. The, the problem for most Hawaii kids is not that they lack technology, but they look at technology as consumers. They want to have the latest iPhone. They want to have the, the latest product. And they want to keep up with the Joneses, with their friends. So they think they're technologically savvy, but they're going to be left in the dust. We have to get our kids to stop thinking as consumers and start thinking as producers. That's the shift that, that, that I would make with any young person. Help that young, you don't have to tell a young person to love technology. Their generation loves technology. There's no question about it. And they're the only ones who know how to work a DVD machine uh, on, your, on your television but they're consumers. And, and the more that we 
create a consumer mindset without a production mindset, we're, we're going to be left in the dust. Producers, creators, entrepreneurs, not employees, but owners. Okay, anybody else? I mean, we, we got about eight more minutes left, so you have to ask away. I got a lot of questions. I, I wanted to ask you about about your about this whole your whole uh, notion of uh, government interference in in projects. So, um, <clears throat> like, we could take the light rail for example. Uh, do you think that that's the reason that it's so bogged down and has had all these problems is because of the high level of interference by government? Well, I wouldn't use the word interference. Uh, from the beginning, it was a government project. And even when we tried to bring the private sector in, it was after, after many years in order to try to find better ways to fund the, a failing project. From the start, it was government trying to create and operate something it did not have competence to do. That was one problem. Another problem is that by becoming a public works problem, it failed to take advantage of the free market. Let me just give you one of many dozens and dozens of examples. Uh, by the time the government got around to planning for rail stops, it realized that it had to actually condemn the land where there would be a rail stop and pay money to businesses and owners in order to acquire that land. Well, if you take a look at almost every other major rail project that has been started in the last 10 years, 20 years across the world, the government did not follow that path of trying to condemn land and pay people for the land. The projects were so attractive that shopping centers, uh, apartment complexes, yeah universities and others would pay the government to put a stop that would bring the market to them. This is just a fundamental economic reality that an entrepreneur would figure out. But our government fails to do that when it's de not dealing with its own money. It's not taking risk with its own money, but it's taking risk with taxpayers' money. And so I just leave that as an illustration. I know our time is running, but I could give you dozens of those kinds of little differences between a public sector project and how an entrepreneur would do it. Yeah. Okay, anybody else? Got any, uh, got any more questions? That's just a couple of, couple of more uh, minutes here. Um, okay, well, um, you know, Kaylee, we got a few more minutes. You wanna, make some closing remarks, uh, wind up. Uh, Pat, I see you came on, you you have a question you wanted to ask? No, okay. Uh, so Kaylee, why don't you kind of just give us a roundup? We got about <clears throat> five minutes left. We covered a lot of ground today. Uh, man, I mean, this is like, a, we just took a high level UH, uh, you know, economics, civics class uh, for the last hour. So thanks for spending that time with us. But uh, yeah, if you want to make any closing remarks, any last things you want to leave with us and uh, then we'll close the meeting up. Well, all I want to say is ultimately thank you. Thank you for caring enough uh, beyond your own families, your jobs and your, your livelihood to come together as Rotarians. I, I think that's an important thing you do and you, you're setting a, a role model for so many others. So I thank you for that. And thanks for letting me be here today. If there's anything I can do to serve you, let me know. That's what we'd love to do at the Grassroot Institute. And once again, I'd invite all of you to subscribe to our free newsletters and research reports mm. and, and take a look at some of the reports I referred to. Just go to grassrootinstitute.org. Yeah. And at any time, if you want to contact me in my role as trustee at large at the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, mm. love to talk with you about that. I, I think that the issues of the Hawaiian people are important to understand because they affect all of us. And if we don't take care of them and have good trustees and officials working on that sector, 
there's a ripple effect that affects our economy, that affects our society. And I think it's important for us to understand that we're all interconnected here in the state of Hawaii. One of the things I, I, I love to say is based upon something we all know in our heart. You, you, you know, you go to any public function and we hear a pule kako, let us pray kako, let us pray yeah. together. Yeah. I also like to say a hana kako, let us work together. Whether we're Democrat or Republican, whether we're of one race or another race, whatever it may be, Hawaii is too small for us not to work together. You know, divided, there's nothing we can do, but united, nothing can stop us. And so I'll, I leave you with that thought, ehana kako, let us work together. Great. Thank Great. you for letting me be with you today. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Kelly. I really uh, appreciate that. I also want to, my last question is that, so all of this work that you're doing, and it sounds like it's a significant amount. So where does the Grassroots Institute get all the funding to make this thing happen? We're an independent nonprofit organization. <clears throat> By design, we refuse to take funding from the government, political parties, military, or the university. That mm -hmm. way we can say anything we want and nobody can fire us. <laughs> yeah. uh, our monies come from individuals like yourselves, yeah. mostly in the state of Hawaii, who um, pitch in with monthly contributions. And wow. uh, okay. there are a lot of people here in our state who really care about the future of, of Hawaii. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much, man. That was a really uh, enlightening uh, hour. I mean, I, I took a, like a, two full pages of notes on all the stuff that you said, because uh, it's important that we, that we know it. So, um, okay, gang, well, I appreciate you guys uh, joining us today. Uh, let's, let's close out. We, we do our little four-way test. So uh, I'll walk right. you guys through that and then we'll, uh, we'll zip you out for the afternoon. So, a uh, four-way test of the things we think, do, or say. First, is it the truth? truth. Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, third will it build good goodwill and better friendships? friendships? Fourth, will it be beneficial, beneficial to all concerned? And fifth, have fun. Have fun. Okay, stop it. Okay. Okay. A Hanakako. Thank you. Mahalo. Aloha, everyone. Mahalo. Thank you. Thank you.